and then we'll look at the perspective of local government. In the first session, we talked about the economic and political opportunities. For the economic side, we talked about improving the quality of government infrastructure and services. And on the political side, we talked about improving government accountability, transparency, and quality of governance. But with opportunities come risks. And I said, for example, to be very careful if you allow local government or state government to borrow. So we have many examples of the risks of subnational borrowing in Latin America. So there's nobody here from Argentina, right? Although Argentinians will also tell you the same story. So even if the central government says we will not, absolutely will not guarantee the debt, if it's a strategic state or city, Buenos Aires, for example, the capital, um, and they have problems repaying the debt, the government must step in and pay. If a big city or an important state is going to default on their debt, it will affect the credit worthiness of the central government. Lenders will see the risk for the central government is high, higher risk, which means the cost will be higher. They will have to pay what we call a risk premium to borrow. And since the private sector borrowing is tied to the risk of the central government, credit for the private sector also becomes more expensive. So you have the risk of macroeconomic instability at the national level. So happened in countries like Brazil, Colombia, the second risk is if the country is already unstable, decentralizing can end the country. Two examples are the former Soviet Union, the USSR, and the former Yugoslavia. You generally like to decentralize when the central government is strong, which leads to the third risk. During the transition to local or state government, often the quality of government infrastructure and services goes down. And again, we'll see this in the Indonesia case. It takes time for the local government to build capacity. So you have a philosophical question here. So let me ask you, philosophers, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> you don't have to answer. But it's like with local government. The central government says, we will not decentralize till you build capacity. We want to make sure public money is well used, well spent. But local government says, we will never develop capacity till we have resources to manage. Who is correct, chicken or egg? It's a very complicated question. And then people ask, will corruption increase or decrease when you decentralize? Increase or decrease? The answer is yes, both. <laughs> you also decentralize corruption, it goes up. But over time, civil society grows, cross-checks grow, government improves, and in the long run, it tends to go down. It's not based on theory, it's based on observation around the world. So if you decentralize, does FDI, foreign direct investment, go up or down? Up or down? Yes, both. Again, in the short term, it tends to go down because there's a lot of confusion and uncertainty for the investor. It's not clear who is responsible for what between levels of government. And if you need to pay somebody a little bit extra to get something done, you're not sure who to pay and what they can do. So if you look at the last three um, risks, they're all short to medium term risks. In the long term, they tend to be very positive, but you have to get to the long term. You have to survive the short term challenges. And then you have risks as seen by subnational government. Often people's expectations are very high that everything will be better tomorrow. But you can see that tomorrow, maybe things will be worse. And we'll give you data from some of our cases later in the week. And I already mentioned the term fiscal gap when local government is told to do many more things with the same money. 
And most decentralization is what we call expenditure-led. That is, you must spend money on all of these things, but I give you no more revenue. Some more problems or challenges. How do you actually measure progress in decentralization if you want to evaluate if it's working or not working? The next slide will have much more detail about how you might want to think about evaluating your experiment to decentralize. We talked about fiscal gap, but a very special type of fiscal gap is something we call unfunded mandate. Let me explain what this is. So this happens in the United States, for example, where the central government says all states or all cities must do something, but we will not help you pay for it. So it's a mandate, it's mandatory, you must do it, but no central government funds. And often the objective is a very good policy objective. For example, you must make all public buildings accessible for the handicapped. So you do not discriminate against those with handicaps. Good objective? Yes? No? How many think it's a good, a good wish, a good objective? But it's very expensive to take a current building and we say retrofit, make it accessible after you build the building. It's very hard, very expensive. An example from emerging economies, for example, in Indonesia, they say everywhere in the country we have minimum service standards. Minimum service standards. Good objective? Good objective, not good objective. Even the poorest parts of the country will have a minimal public service standard. Everywhere. Good hope, good policy, but very, very expensive. Who's going to pay? We will see in our cases that after decentralization, local government often becomes more dependent on the central government, not less. Often, we said there is a transfer program to close the fiscal gap. But you have to be poor to get more money. The poorer you are, the more grant money you get. If you increase local tax revenue, you are less poor. If you are richer, what happens to your grant money? Central government doesn't seem to understand. Central government should think like local government. What would I do with this formula? So think about it. We'll come back with many examples, but it's the same mistake over and over from country to country. We say that you are creating a perverse or a negative incentive. Instead of increasing local revenue, you are providing incentive not to increase local revenue. Except in very big cities where local revenue will be much larger than the transfer. My question for you, is local government crazy to do this? Tell me. Are they stupid? Are they crazy? What do you think? Tell me. A new voice. Yes. New voice. Does the strategy make sense for local government? We're not going to go on until I hear your opinion. <laughs> I'm very patient. <laughs> I have some good water over here I can drink <laughs> while I'm waiting. If my central grant will be reduced. I would like to think about the collect the taxation of the local government. I think local government had to collect the tax because uh, because uh, uh, because uh, local government uh, have have uh, laws and orders for the tax. Uh, local government. Uh, well, look at government, if they look at government, uh, collect the debts, look at government's uh, ability is an uh, increase. Uh, increase? Increase the uh, ability, ability or uh, implementation uh, activities. 
So I collect so, one million more local revenue. Yes. My grant is cut one million. <laughs> Am I more able now? Yeah. You think? Yes, I think. Net difference is zero. But the political difference is very big. It's the politics. So let me ask you another question. Do people like to pay taxes? How many people love to pay taxes? Not understand the reason, but love to do this. You are very happy. You enjoy paying taxes. It's different knowing your obligation and the reason why we have taxes. It's quite different than giving you great joy. It makes you very happy. Do other people get happy paying taxes? There, well, we have one. You work for the revenue department? Yes. The, the point is, why am I asking this? Local government, you work very hard to increase taxes. So people are angry with you. You lose a lot of political capital, political goodwill, trying to get people to pay fair taxes. Good, fair taxes, but people will be unhappy. Why not just take the free money and not get everybody angry? And administratively, it costs money to collect taxes. So you're spending money, you're working very hard, you're making people angry, and then your free money is reduced. So you don't have to believe me. I will give you data from other countries to show this happens in many places. And my point is, it's quite rational and very predictable. And I think in the session that Suantan will do on government transfers, might provide some suggestions on formulas that can try to balance equalizing for poor areas, but also providing incentives to mobilize your own local resources. Maybe there's different formulas that can change the incentives. So maybe I didn't convince you yet, but be patient and see what you think by Friday afternoon. Well, let me give you a couple of other problems. So sometimes in decentralization, it becomes less efficient economically. If the government doesn't have the capacity, for example, they will make many bad investments with a lot of waste and perhaps corruption and leakage. Another problem is often when decentralization is ordered by the central government and then they create the Ministry of Decentralization or they create a Ministry of Local Government. <clears throat> central Government, Ministry of Decentralization or Ministry of local government. Japan has done this. So think about this. My ministry depends on managing decentralization. If it is successful, I don't have a job anymore. My ministry is finished. Um, so this is what we call politically top-down order decentralization, but then you create a ministry who would be killing itself if it's successful. And sometimes, of course, the whole concept can be poorly designed or poorly implemented. Or sometimes the central government policies will have different priorities than local government, but both policies are good. Maybe the central government wants to focus on maternal and infant care, and local government wants the first priority to be primary education. Both are very good objectives. Which one do you follow? Which one has higher priority? When we talk about measuring decentralization, how successful are you in measuring decentralization? I would focus on the first three points. You can look at your progress over time, or you can compare local governments or jurisdictions that are similar, maybe similar size or similar wealth or with countries that are similar to your country in terms of size or income level. But if you're looking over time or between jurisdictions, what are you counting? 
we already talked about money. Money is an easy thing to count over time or between different jurisdictions or between different countries. You can count employees at different levels of government or you can combine these things to look at cost effectiveness. How many workers per population? How much revenue per worker? How much per schoolhouse? How much per school bus? These are things you can do yourself with your existing data. You have most of this in your budget. You don't need a big expensive survey. You don't have to hire a foreign consultant. Technically it's very easy, but many countries don't want to do this. Why? It's not a technical problem. If you look at spending efficiency, cost effectiveness, what's the risk? Look at unit costs, look at product per unit, things that are easy to count. Look at quality, how many students per class, how many students per teacher. What's the risk? What's the problem? Forget the theory, forget the textbooks, think about real world politics. What's the problem? That they don't want to know everything to others. Because? They don't want to know. Why? Uh, how how they are stupid or something like this. <laughs> this could be local government, not central. It could be local government. You are correct. They do not want to be transparent in many countries. Why? You can help him. Please help. So somebody is going to help you. Please. Uh, I think uh, some problems are uh, not necessarily or they, uh, they are not need to solve, I think. Uh, they are not. Some problems are not need to be solved. Huh? Okay. We don't need to solve uh, some problems. Uh, he said that might be the, the, the reason is, might be the, how can I say, in some cases, you don't need to solve the prob uh, every problem. And some problem, like you may overcome some problems by just um, going along with it, or, or like, what problems? <laughs> I'm very slow today. I, I don't understand. So the go maybe uh, the government may be concerned that like if they review every data or everything they are doing, and the public will know everything they are doing, and then the public will say that okay, this is not good with you guys, and then uh, that the government doesn't want that. Yes, I mean there are two results that would be very inconvenient for the government. Maybe some local governments aren't doing a good job. The results are not very good for their income level or their size compared with a similar local government. The performance is bad. This is, this is not um, something you want to show. But what, for example, if the unit cost for a school bus is double the next jurisdiction, same bus, same year, same model, everything's the same, but one is two times the other. Maybe people will ask where the money is going. <laughs> people might ask, we have all of this leakage, but the ground, it is dry. I don't understand. In short, it would increase transparency and accountability, which could be quite inconvenient for some local governments. Skeptical, I put in a slide, just to make my point very, very clear. Most types of decentralization are politically driven. That is, there's a political reason why you want to decentralize, and you lead with expenditures by telling local government they have new responsibilities. So politically driven and led by new expenditure responsibilities. So we'll see this, for example, in the Indonesia case. Philippines, the same. Yep. So then you have a fiscal gap between the new responsibilities and the money they have to pay for it. So then you close the gap by having a national resource transfer program, but the unintended consequence 
is that local government has a disincentive, not an incentive, to mobilize its own local revenue, local taxes, local charges. And I said this is rational, it is smart by local leaders, and very predictable. And it happens for two reasons. One, the central government doesn't think like local government. What would I do if I were governor or mayor? The second reason is what we call the silo um, structure of government where different parts don't talk to each other. Which part of the government manages the transfers to local government? Which part of the government? The people who, who, who do the budget expenditure. The budget people, yeah? They spend the money. Who's interested in revenue generation? Yeah, yes. they're both in the same ministry, yeah. but different parts. Yeah. You're absolutely right, it's finance and planning, but then you have the spending people and the tax people. And they have very different objectives. The most important slide of the session. That's why I'm spending time on it. It's the most, we say counterintuitive, it's not what you think would happen. But it happens over and over in country after country. So if you remember nothing else, remember if you give local government new functions and then you're going to help them pay for the functions with a transfer program, what are your incentives to make local government more fiscally independent, not more dependent. Later this week, we will give you specific examples with empirical data to support this observation. I'd like to spend the last few minutes before lunch talking in general around the world what has worked, what has not worked, and why or why not. In general, you get mixed results. Some parts worked, some parts did not work. And the more successful ones learned from what was not working and made revisions over time. So they were constantly evolving. And as I mentioned earlier, you have common measurement problems, unfunded mandates, and centrally managed decentralization. Other key reasons for failures are the implementation by local government was poor and the investments were inefficient and ineffective. They were ordered, as we said, from the top down rather than a discussion between levels of government. Poor general design or implementation or competing good policy objectives. The successes. So what were some of the factors that contributed to the more successful decentralization programs? They were relatively low profile and focused and manageable in the following way. So they tend to be small in scope at the beginning. They were done incrementally in phases, focusing on very specific functions that we talked about earlier, and asymmetrical, which means they were not done everywhere at the same time to the same degree. The alternative is what we call Big Bang, where you do everything everywhere at one time. That's much riskier. At all. So Big Bang is boom. Big bang. The more common practice is Big Bang and not incremental. For political reason. It's difficult to be seen as favoring one part of the country over another part of the country. And if you give too much autonomy to one part, it might appear as if they will break away completely. And the more successful usually included a package of interventions including capacity building, incentives, civil service reform, high level political commitment, dynamism which means it evolved over time, a well designed grant transfer system with some tax decentralization. So it's a package of many things. And it's interesting, <clears throat> some factors that seemed important looking 
across many countries were the age of the country, so the older, more established, stronger states were more successful. Decentralization looked at Niyama, Nangani, Miabia, or Chi like the Kama, or Lubyomle, Almiare, a chatty, or Pian Bureau, Gime solution, support Pere, or not Taupan Bire, a chatty, or Gime solution. Size of the economy, the larger economies tend to do better. The more developed the mass media, the more successful. More industrialized had higher chances of success. The more local government units, the highest success rate. This is not a theory. It was done by a specialist, Dennis Rondinelli, who looked at experiments all around the world. And these are just observations. We're not saying one thing caused another, but they're just correlated. They happened at the same time. Factors did not, that did not seem to matter were how big the country was geographically. You have big and small countries, successful and not successful. Same with population size and density, it didn't seem to matter very much. How urbanized did not seem to matter so much. The form of government didn't seem to matter that much. Ethnic composition, the mix did not seem to matter a lot. And I'd like to close with just some warnings back to the risks of fiscal decentralization. So this is the last slide. It could make the country politically more unstable, and I gave examples of countries that fell apart. So if you have a lot of administrative or political or economic problems, this will not fix it. And as I mentioned earlier, in the short run, it could make things less stable, less efficient, and more corrupt. Going back to the experience from Latin America, it can actually make the country, the macroeconomy, unstable. Because local government thinks, in the end, the central government will save them, so they keep borrowing even when they cannot repay. If the local government doesn't have capacity or a program to improve capacity, very important public services and infrastructure can suffer. And we talked about decentralized corruption and the uncertainty. Businesses can price corruption as a cost of doing business and pass on the costs, but it's very difficult for them to manage the risk of uncertainty. And last, it could actually make things more unequal in a country as the um, Rich areas get richer and the poor areas get poorer, which is often why you have the transfer program to equalize between rich and poor areas. I said this was my last slide, but really, this is my last slide. And it comes back again to competition over resources between levels of government and at the same level of government. So the first half of today, we covered a lot of complicated themes to prepare the foundation for the rest of the week. So we'll come back to these themes in more detail with many specific examples. So I think we've probably given you enough food for thought until now. Okay, have a good lunch, and we'll see you after lunch to start doing cases.